Sandman Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes, written by Neil Gaiman, art by Sam Keith, Mike Dragonberg, and Malcolm Jones III. Alright, Sandman by Neil Gaiman is the next series I'm going to be covering on my channel. This is a very trippy, avant-garde, high-concept series about a literal lord of dreams that has a whole dream world. When I initially read this series, it was highly recommended. So many people have it on their best comic ever lists. And when I began reading it, I didn't fully buy into it and appreciate it right away. In the beginning, it kind of seems like this horror book with lots of obscure DC characters, some of which I've never heard of before. But as the series goes on, it really grows beyond that horror beginning and becomes sort of a greater exploration of mythology and storytelling and various other themes, and it can be heavily analyzed, and you can get so many things out of this series. So this is one I definitely want to cover. It's a very difficult series to cover because there is so much about it, but I'm very excited to go through it all with you. And now, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down the story in Volume 1. I'm going to be narrating a summarized, paraphrased version of the story. And before I do that, though, I have about a 10 minute or so introduction where I'm going to break down what is Sandman, who are some of the characters in it, and what is the cultural historical context of the book, and some of the publication history of it as well, as we head into the future where we're going to have a Netflix series coming out within the next year or so. So let's dive into it. Sandman Preludes and Nocturnes. Sandman is about the story of an entity named Dream. Dream is the Lord of Dreams, or the personification of all dreams. And he rules the place where we spend a third of our life, sleeping in dreams. He can make himself look like anything, but he generally appears as a pale white guy with dark eyes and shaggy black hair. Dream, he has many names. He is also known as Morpheus. That is probably the most used other name within this series. But there is also Oniros, the Shaper, the Shaper of Form, the Lord of the Dreaming, the Dream King, the Dream Sneak, the Cat of Dreams, the Prince of Stories, Murphy, Kaikukul, and Lord Zorro. So many different names for Dream. Dream, he belongs to a family called the Endless. The Endless are a powerful family of beings, older than gods. The Endless are mostly a somewhat dysfunctional family of seven siblings. These siblings are the personification of ideas and concepts that are tied to life, and were fated to fulfill their functions until the universe ends and all life disappears from the cosmos. The main members of this family are Dream, of course, the Lord of Dreams. There is also his sister Death, who appears in the form of an attractive-looking goth girl. She is the sibling closest to Dream. She is actually surprisingly upbeat, considering her job. Everyone meets her twice. At birth, she gives the breath of life, and then she is there at the time of your death to transition you to the afterlife. There is Destiny. He is the oldest. He wears a cowl over his face. He is blind, but can see. He is lord and personification of all destiny and freedom. He has absolute power over his realm, which is a garden containing all possible destinies of past, present, and future. There is destruction. He appears as a broad-shouldered, red-headed man. He is both a lord and personification of all destruction and creation. He has power over the action and process of destroying as well as the act of making, inventing, or producing. There is Desire. Desire is the older twin of Despair. Desire has no gender and appears in the form that one most desires. It is impulsive and self-centered. Desire's vanity holds no bounds. There is Despair, the younger twin of Desire and Despair appears to be a squat, naked, morbidly obese woman. Her realm is a gray, foggy space filled with rats and mirrors which she uses to look upon people in their despair. There is Delirium. She is the youngest of the Endless. She used to be known as Delight, and she was the personification of pleasure and joy, but 
she has evolved into this delirium long before the onset of the story. In the Sandman Overture prequel comic, we also meet Knight, who is their mother, and Time, who is their father. Sandman was published at DC Comics over 75 issues from 1989 to 1996. It is one of the first few graphic novels to be on the New York Times bestseller list. It was a very popular series. The series has exerted considerable influence over the fantasy genre and graphic novel medium since its publication. It is a super trippy series, very avant-garde at times, and can be a little bit hard to get into. Neil Gaiman himself really evolved what the series was meant to be as it went on. The series grew out of a proposal to adapt an old Silver Age Jack Kirby comic character called the Sandman, who had the alter ego Wesley Dodds. But instead, DC editor at the time, Karen Berger, told Neil Gaiman that they would like him to create a new Sandman. He could keep the name Sandman, but the rest of the character was up to him. So Neil, using his ideas, he created a character that lived in dreams. He created the character of Morpheus, a literal take on the folklore concept of the Sandman and a personification of dreaming itself. The core series, the 75 initial issues, are collected in 10 trade paperbacks. I consider these essential to the complete Sandman story and the rest to be a little bit more optional. Beyond the core 10 volumes, there was a 1999 graphic novel called The Dream Hunters, which is a retelling of a Japanese fairy tale. This one was actually published in prose form as well as in graphic novel comic book form. In 2003, there was a graphic novel called The Sandman Endless Nights, which was an anthology volume featuring seven chapters, each one focusing on a different member of the Endless, some set during the Sandman's initial series and a few set after. There's also a prequel book in 2013 called Sandman Overture, which is set before the initial Sandman series. And even though it is a prequel, I would not read it before the initial series. I would start with Volume 1 and read it at the end if you want, as Overture can be pretty complex and hard to get into if you're not familiar with the overall Sandman universe. Beyond this, there are a whole bunch of spin-off books, most of them not written by Neil Gaiman, so books like Lucifer, The Dreaming, House of Whispers, Books of Magic, etc. DC in 2018 even started a whole The Sandman Universe line of books. But like I said, don't get too caught up on all of the peripheral Sandman material. If you want to get into Sandman, just read the 10 core volumes and feel free to stop there or read more if you want. Now, there have been many failed movie adaptations over the years, all throughout the 90s and 2000s. Some of them seemed really poorly thought out. A 1998 leaked script draft of Sandman reworked the Sandman into a slasher movie and set up a new protagonist. It just sounded really bad. Gaiman called it the worst script he ever read. Warner Brothers in 2013, with David S. Goyer and Joseph Gordon-Levitt attached, were envisioning a whole Harry Potter-sized movie franchise which I think would have been really cool. That adaptation unfortunately failed, though. In 2020, a full-cast audio dramatization of the first three volumes of Sandman was published by Audible, and it had an all-star cast doing the voices with James McAvoy, Kat Dennings, Riz Ahmed, and many more narrating. Most recently, though, and most excitingly, Netflix is in the works of adapting a Sandman TV show, a release date is still TBD, but this one seems like it's actually going forward and is happening, and maybe very promising. That is essentially your introduction to Sandman. This is a very complicated, complex book with lots of symbolism, imagery, and obscure references, and everything can be heavily analyzed for deeper meaning, so I will do my best to give you a brief overview of the story and explain some of the underlying symbolism. 
But for the full story experience, you should really buy the books yourself to really try and grasp everything, see if you can catch stuff that I missed. If you're gonna buy the series, consider using my Amazon affiliate link in the description of the video to help support my channel. There are these really nice Sandman box sets that collect the entire series. That's what I own myself, personally. All right. Let's dive into the story now for Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes. Issue 1, Sleep of the Just. The year is 1916. We are in England. We meet a doctor. His name is Dr. John Hathaway. He is the senior curator of the Royal Museum. He arrives at a palatial mansion to the home of a man named Roderick Burgess. Roderick Burgess is also known as Lord Magus. He is the leader of a group called the Order of the Ancient Mysteries. John gets ushered into the mansion and he has a meeting with this Roderick Burgess. John, his son Edmund, died a week ago at sea in a sunken destroyer and he is distraught about it. Roderick has promised John that if he gives him a certain book, that is stored in safekeeping at the Royal Museum, that Roderick could return John's son Edmund to life. John gives Roderick the book. The book is called the Magdalene Grimoire. It is an ancient book of magic. When Roderick is given the book, he is excited. He says, ah, the Magdalene Grimoire was all that the order needed. We can hold this ceremony at the next full moon. No one need die ever again. A few nights later at the next full moon, Roderick and his order of ancient mysteries proceed to the basement of his mansion. They have all sorts of mystical writings on the floor and a big circle drawn as well. Roderick, he leads the group in an incantation. They are trying to summon the entity known as Death. The order is chanting Come, come, come. Roderick is saying the incantation. He says, I call you with names, O oh my lord, O oh my lord. I summon with poison and summon with pain. I open the way and I open the gates. Come, come, come. I summon you in the names of the old lords. Namtar, Alutu, Morax, Niburius, Clash, Vepar, Maimon. We summon. Come, come, come. After a whole bunch of other nonsense incantation stuff, eventually Morpheus, aka Dream, aka the Sandman, gets summoned in the middle of the room, in the middle of this circle drawn on the floor. Dream, he has his signature tools with him, which serve as his symbols of power. He is wearing his helmet of dreams. This mask-like helm was crafted by Dream from the spine and skull of a god eons ago. Dream, he uses the helm to serve as his sigil. There is Dream's sand pouch. There is also Dream's dreamstone or Dream ruby. Also, it is known by its more complicated name, Metripitacon. Dream, he has poured some of his essence into this dreamstone to help aid him in his work. It is a powerful item that allows the wielder to see dreams and bring them into reality, along with reshaping reality itself. Dream, he is lying there trapped. Roderick Burgess is disappointed though. Him and the Order, they were trying to summon death, not dream. They don't want dream. Things did not work out how he wanted. The year was 1916. This was the year that Roderick Burgess captured Dream, or Morpheus, the Sandman. Well, Roderick, he ended up keeping Dream trapped there in his basement for many years. They placed Dream inside a glass crystal cell, which will imprison Dream's material aspect. And the circle drawn on the floor surrounding Dream will stop him from ever getting out unless the circle were to ever get broken. Dream, he is awake, but he can't do anything. He can't get out. Roderick attempts to get Dream to 
give him power in some way, but Dream, he never budged. He just watched, watched, and waited. And the years passed. 1920, John Hathaway, the man that gave Roderick the book, he commits suicide. He regrets ever giving Roderick Burgess that damn book. The press, they tied John Hathaway to Roderick Burgess and his organization, the Order of Ancient Mysteries, but no link could ever be proven. In 1930, the Order of Ancient Mysteries had a schism. The second in command, a man named Ruth Van Sykes, he ran off with Roderick Burgess's mistress, a woman named Ethel Cripps. They stole about $200,000 in cash, which in 1930 was a lot of money. They also made off with some of the magical items that belonged to Dream, such as his helmet, his pouch of sand, and his ruby. Roderick Burgess and his son Alex Burgess, they decided to declare a magical war on Ruth Van Sykes and Ethel Cripps. Ruth Van Sykes, in order to protect himself, he met with a demon called Koranzon, and he traded Dream's dream helmet away in exchange for an amulet of protection. This amulet of protection will protect him from any curses or magical attacks that Roderick Burgess could attempt to get him with. Turns out that that was a very good idea because Roderick, now in this magical war with Ruthven Sykes, he performed some sort of ritual which should kill Ruthven. But Ruthven, he had this amulet. Problem is though, in 1936, Ethel Cripps, she left Ruthven and she took the Amulet of Protection with her. Ruth Van Sykes, now without the Amulet of Protection, is affected by the curse ritual that Roderick performed years ago, and it now kills him instantly. His head explodes. After all these years that Dream has been trapped in the basement of Roderick Burgess, away from his realm and responsibilities, a lot of the world began to fall into something called sleepy sickness. People all across the world were falling asleep and not waking up, or they would wake up maybe once or twice a year, if even. In 1939, a woman named Ellie Marston, she falls asleep and she only awoke twice in the last decade. She is a grown woman, but she has been asleep most her life. She thinks she is still eight years old. A man named Daniel Bustamante has been asleep for 13 years. A woman named Unity Kincaid has been asleep for many years. Seven years ago, she was raped in her sleep and gave birth to a baby girl. The scandal was hushed up and the baby was adopted. But Unity Kincaid never knew. She slept through the whole thing. Unity Kincaid is an important character that will come back into the story in future volumes. Now, in a nod to the original Sandman, the Jack Kirby Sandman, the universe, it sought for a replacement to fill the void left by Dream. So, Wesley Dodds was imparted with some of Dream's power, and as a result, suffered insomnia from prophetic dreams of criminal activities and the vision of Dream. To quell this, Wesley, he created the identity of the Sandman, based on Dream's image. He wore a green suit, fedora, and a gas mask. And he utilized a tranquilizer gun that emitted sleeping gas to subdue criminals, haunting his dreams. He eventually would go on to be a founder of the Justice Society of America. In 1947, Roderick Burgess goes down to his basement to try and talk with Dream. Roderick, at this point, is 84 years old and will die soon. He curses Dream for not helping him. He says, You aren't death, but you live forever and you haven't aged a day since we caught you. You could have given me power beyond my wildest dreams. I didn't have to get old. Dream, he is awake in the circle, but he is trapped. He can't escape. He watches Roderick, his captor, grow old and will soon pass away, but 
it still doesn't satisfy Dream that much. Roderick died later that year in 1947. In 1955, Alex Burgess, the son of Roderick Burgess, he is continuing to run his father's organization leading the Order of the Ancient Mysteries. Alex, he is wondering what to do with Dream. He is confiding with Paul McGuire, his longtime personal assistant. Paul warns Alex, what if the police find out about the kidnapping, the guy in the basement? Alex says they won't. He's been down there for 40 years without eating or sleeping. We're safer just leaving him down there. I'll be dead before he ever gets out, and then he'll be someone else's problem. Alex, one day, he goes down to the basement to talk with Dream. He tries to make a deal with him. If Dream offers him power, immortality, and a promise he won't seek revenge, then Alex will let him out. Dream refuses. It is now 1970. Alex has handed over the reins of the Order of the Ancient Mysteries to Paul McGuire. Paul is not a true believer in magic. He just wants to use the Order as a way to get gullible people to give him their money. In 1972, Alex talks with Dream again and asks him, Why won't you talk to me? In 1978, Alex blames Dream. He says that he hasn't had a good night's sleep in 60 years. In 1982, Alex threatens Dream, says that he could torture him. In 1988, Alex, who is now very old and in a wheelchair, says he is glad they trapped Dream down here. He tells Dream that he is nothing special, just a naked man in a glass box. Dream, he thinks, soon. Alex asks for Paul to wheel him back to his study, but when he does... Alex's wheelchair rolls over the circle drawn on the floor, the one that needs to be intact to imprison Dream. The circle's integrity is broken now. It has been disturbed. There are two guards left to downstairs in that basement, left to watch Dream. Dream, he is very weak right now, very weak, not powerful. But with the circle broken, Dream he uses his influence and makes one of the guards fall asleep, just for a moment. I'm going to refer to Dream as his other name, Morpheus, from now on, so we don't get confused when I reference an actual Dream, as opposed to Dream the Sandman, aka Morpheus, or his many other names. So Morpheus, he is sitting there, and he thinks it begins. Now, that guard, he is dreaming, and in that dream, he is on a beach. And Morpheus, he manages to enter that dream, and he grabs some sand on the beach there, within the dream. The other guard wakes up the guard that was sleeping. They're both back in the real world now, and they see Morpheus on the floor, and he looks dead. Morpheus, he's just lying there. The guards, they panic, and they call Paul McGuire back into the room. They all think that Morpheus is maybe dead. Paul decides that they should probably take a look at him. They use the key and open the glass cell. Morpheus, though, he was just playing possum. He is, in fact, alive. Paul and some of the others, they unlock the glass cell, and they enter it. Morpheus, with the sand he managed to take from the guard's dream, he blows the sand in all of their faces and manages to make them all fall asleep. Morpheus, he then escapes out of the glass cell and into the world of the dreaming. He has successfully gotten away. Morpheus, he then escapes into various people's dreams and he eats some of the food within their dreams and it nourishes him. This is his first food in 70 years. Morpheus then creates himself some clothing. He now wants to get all of his tools back that were stolen from him and get his revenge. All around the world, various people that had the sleeping sickness, they now wake up and snap out of their afflictions. Ellie Marston, Daniel Bustamante, Unity Kincaid all wake up. 
unity, she cries. She says that she dreamt she had a baby. She, of course, did have a baby. She does not remember that, though. Alex Burgess, he falls asleep. Morpheus visits Alex in his dream. And Alex, he recognizes Morpheus and is scared. He apologizes to him. He says it was all his father's idea to kidnap him. He never would have done it himself. He explains that they were trying to summon death, not him. Morpheus asks where his tools are. His helmet, pouch of sand, and ruby. Alex says that Ruthven Sykes made off with that stuff 50 years ago and they never saw any of it again. Morpheus replies, I see. Morpheus decides to punish Alex and punish him by making him suffer from something called eternal waking. Morpheus then leaves and Alex's eternal waking begins. Alex, he'll be in the middle of a bad dream, a nightmare, and he'll wake up and he'll think that he's awake, but he is actually just in another bad dream and he will keep on waking up over and over and over again and think that he is actually awake this time only to discover yet again he is still dreaming. Thereby he will be eternally waking and he will never actually wake up. The others in the mansion eventually go to check on Alex, but Alex is just sleeping mumbling, no, 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 please. And that is the end of issue one. Issue 2, Imperfect Hosts. Morpheus has now escaped his imprisonment. He was captured in 1916, and it is now 1988. He has been imprisoned for 72 years. 1988 is the year that Sandman first began publishing, so 1988 is considered the present day in this book. The Netflix TV show apparently will have Morpheus being captive for 110 years, which will set the story closer to the present day. Morpheus, he returns back to his realm, referred to as the Dreaming. He returns to his kingdom, and we meet many of the others there that serve him in the Dreaming. There is Cain and Abel. They are dreams that embody the characters in the biblical story of the same name. The first murderer, Cain, and the first victim, Abel. Within the Sandman series, Cain is constantly killing his brother Abel, and Abel never seems to stay dead. Cain actually loves his brother Abel and genuinely cares about him, but he is easily infuriated by him and has an obsessive compulsive disorder where he is unable to stop killing him. Both of these characters are actually really old DC characters that Neil Gaiman was a fan of, and he reworked them into the world of Sandman. Kane, he was actually the host character of a horror anthology comic called The House of Mystery, and Abel was the host character of a different horror anthology comic called The House of Secrets, and both series ran from the 1950s through to the early 1980s. In Sandman, both brothers live as neighbors in the Dreaming, Cain in the House of Mystery and Abel in the House of Secrets. The two brothers are talking, and they hear a knock at the door. It is Morpheus. They run to see him. Morpheus has been carried to their home by a large green gargoyle named Gregory. Gregory is Cain's pet. Morpheus, when he arrived at the edge of the Dreaming, he was too weak to reach his castle. He was weak because he was in prison for the last 70 or so years, and he used the last of his residual power to bind Alex into eternal waking. Luckily, this Gregory retrieved Morpheus and dropped him off here at the doorstep of Cain and Abel. Morpheus is placed in a bed in Cain's house of mystery and is given time to recover. Cain and Abel are serving Dream food and trying to make him feel better. Dream asks if they have anything of his, anything he created. Abel tells Morpheus that he has their letters of commission that he wrote for both of them, and he signed it even. Morpheus tells them to fetch these letters for him. 
When he is given the letters, Morpheus then absorbs them into him, and he absorbs the fragment of himself that he placed in these letters eons ago, and he begins to feel a little bit better. Over in Gotham City, we see Ethel Cripps. She is about 90 years old at this point. She was the one that left the Order of the Ancient Mysteries in the 1930s with Ruthven Sykes and made off with Dream's Helmet, Pouch of Sand, and Dreamstone Ruby. She goes to Arkham Asylum, a place in Gotham City where they keep the criminally insane. Gotham City is of course a real fixture in the Batman comics. Well, Ethel, she arrives at Arkham Asylum, and she demands to see her son. She has been looking for her son for 10 years. Well, they allow it. They bring Ethel to see her son. Ethel's son is a man named John D, otherwise known by his criminal persona of Dr. Destiny. Dr. Destiny is actually a very old DC Comics supervillain. His first appearance was in Justice League of America Volume 1 Number 5 in 1961. He was a petty criminal scientist who used his genius to create astounding devices for crime. Well, Neil Gaiman retconned Dr. Destiny a bit to make him fit into the story. Apparently, his mother, Ethel Cripps, back in the day, gave her son John D. Morpheus's Dreamstone Ruby. Dr. Destiny manipulated the Dreamstone, put all sorts of circuitry in it, and with that new Dreamstone, he could create reality from the fabric of dreams, and he would use it to torture the Justice League. His power was so great that the Justice League had to resort to drastic measures to stop him. They hypnotized him and manipulated his psyche to prevent him from dreaming. And this kept him from using the Dreamstone for criminal purposes. But it caused him to lose his mind and shrivel to a skeletal wreck of a man. No longer the powerful superhuman we saw previously battling the Justice League. He was then sent to Arkham Asylum where his sanity eroded further. The Dreamstone was then sent elsewhere for safekeeping away from Dr. Destiny. The Arkham Asylum doctor brings Ethel Cripps to see her son, and she sees that he has lost his mind and is shriveled. John says to his mother, Mother, you look so old. Things are so strange these days. They took my dreams away from me. Ethel is told that she is making her son overexcited and they send her away. Morpheus, now feeling better, begins walking in the dream world. He wants to go see his castle. He walks past the House of Mystery and Secrets and he approaches the gates of Horn and Ivory. Morpheus is then greeted by Lucian. Lucian served on Dream's palace staff as the chief librarian overseeing a collection of every book that has ever been imagined, even if the book has never even been published or even written. When Dream was captured in 1916, Lucian was the only member of Dream's staff who did not abandon his post, and he stayed and he tried to maintain the integrity of the Dreaming as much as was possible in his maker's absence. Morpheus, seeing his castle all broken and deteriorating, is saddened by it. Lucian says, Breaks your heart, my lord, doesn't it? Lucian explains what's been going on since Morpheus has been gone. How the dreaming started to decay with him being away. Lucian mentions some minor dream realm characters, but we have little context for them at this point. He says that Eve the Raven Woman has decayed badly and she lives only in nightmares now. Brute and Glob, who are nightmares created by Morpheus, well, they vanished almost 40 years ago. The Fashion Thing, otherwise known as the Mad Madonna Witch or the Mad Yuppie Witch, she has also disappeared about a year ago. All of the palace's other servants have dispersed back into the dream stuff that formed them. 
Lucian says that Cain and Abel are still around, though. Morpheus says yes, he's encountered them already. We jump back over to Cain and Abel. Cain gives Abel a present. It is an egg. Inside the egg is a little creature. Abel likes the gift. It is a little gargoyle. Abel wants to name the gargoyle Irving, but Cain grows angry, he says. He can't call it Irving. Gargoyles must have a name that starts with G. Cain then kills Abel. We jump back over to Morpheus. He wants to begin rebuilding his life, rebuilding his realm, but first he needs information. So, Morpheus goes to visit the three witches. They have many names. Hecate, the Fates, the Weird Sisters, the Kindly Ones, etc. The individual witches greet Morpheus and he talks with them. The witches explain that their names are Cynthia, Mordred, and Mildred. Based on the rules that witches follow, Morpheus is allowed to ask them three questions. One question to each witch. Morpheus, he wants to know where his three tools are, so he asks them. He asks where his pouch of sand is. The one witch tells him an Englishman named John Constantine has it. If you know your DC comics, you should know who John Constantine is. He's a very popular character, an occult detective from Liverpool, England, and he especially deals with the darker, more horror aspects of the DC universe. Morpheus then asks where his helmet is. The witch answers that it was traded away to a demon. Morpheus wants to know which demon, but he's only allowed one question per witch. So he asks the last witch, where is his dreamstone ruby? She says your gem passed through a mother to a son who tapped its dream magics for his own ends until it, until his dreams were taken away from him by the superhumans. Ask the Justice League about its present whereabouts. The witches leave and with that Morpheus begins walking. He is going to retrieve all his items of power. But which one first? He decides the pouch of sand will be easiest. He will begin there with John. Constantine. Elsewhere, we see Abel has came back to life. He crawled out of his grave, and he returns to his house of secrets to his new gargoyle pet, the one that he wanted to name Irving. Well, Abel decides to call it Goldie instead, following his brother's wishes of giving it a name starting with G. Issue 3, Dream a Little Dream of Me. We see John Constantine. He is in his apartment. The alarm goes off. It is 10.45 a.m. John wakes up, brushes his teeth, puts a cigarette in his mouth, and heads down to a nearby diner. There, he runs into a homeless woman named Mad Hetty. John talks to her. Mad Hetty warns John that Morpheus, the Sandman, is back. John brushes the story of the Sandman away as superstition. Mad Hetty angry says that she's been alive for 247 years and she knows that he's back. John, he continues on with his life, but finally, three days later at his apartment, he is finally greeted by Morpheus, the Sandman himself. John is a little startled at first. Morpheus explains that John came into possession of a leather pouch of his that had been filled with sand. He wants to know where it is. John, he remembers the pouch. He explains that he bought it years ago at a garage sale in San Francisco, but he can never get the drawstrings on the pouch open. Morpheus asks, where is it now? John says it's probably in his friend Chaz's storage facility. So the two of them travel to the storage facility, but it is not there. John, he's looking through his things, and he sees a picture of his old girlfriend, a woman named Rachel, and he figures that Rachel has it. Rachel was John's ex, and she eventually ran off with a lot of John's things, and she sold them for drugs. 
he figures that she's the one that stole Morpheus's pouch of sand. John doesn't know where Rachel lives now, though, but they drive over to Rachel's dad's house to ask him where they can find her. When they arrive at the house, though, everything seems a little bit fishy. The electricity is off, and there is six months worth of mail piled up on the floor, and there is a terrible smell in the air. As they are walking through the house, they see a man lying on the floor. He came in here in an attempt to burglarize the place. He's alive, but Morpheus explains that the man, he's being eaten by dreams. It is dark in the house. John, he's trying to see with his lighter. He has his lighter on, but Morpheus just creates some light for John to help him see. They continue walking through the house, and they eventually enter a room, and John Constantine finds himself getting sucked into a dream. He is falling from the sky, but Morpheus pulls him out of the dream, though, and back into the real world. The pouch of sand, it must be nearby, and it must have affected John somehow. As they enter this other room, they find Rachel's dad is here, and he's still alive, but his body is inside out, and it is made to be wallpaper. I repeat, though, he's apparently still alive somehow, even though he's wallpaper. John asks Morpheus, how is he still alive? And Morpheus answers, the pouch. They keep walking. The wall now turns green and appears to be a whole bunch of little creatures. And they are telling them to leave here. Do not disturb. Morpheus tells the wall that this has gone far enough. You have exceeded your bounds. The green creatures in the wall, they must be creatures of nightmare, and they recognize Morpheus as their master now returned. So they apologize to him and they leave them alone. Morpheus and John enter a bedroom and they find Rachel there, finally. Rachel, she looks terrible, emaciated. She creepily sings to them some lyrics to the 1958 song, all I Have to Do is Dream by the Everly Brothers. Rachel hums, Dream, dream, dream. All I have to do is dream. When Rachel was dating John, he could never get the pouch of sand open. Well, when Rachel left John, she took the pouch of sand with her, among with a whole bunch of other possessions. And she became obsessed with opening the pouch. And she eventually succeeded, and she became addicted to the dream sand within. She retreated to her father's house outside of London, and she did nothing but indulge in the sand. She dissolved it in her mouth, rubbed it on her skin, or breathed it in. But each time it gave her dreams, she no longer ate, and she became emaciated. Her hair fell out in clumps, and she was covered in bed sores, and her skin was flaking and infected, but everything went away when the dreams came, and that was all she lived for. Morpheus, he takes his bag of sand away from Rachel, and he tells John that they can leave now, and the living dreams that occupy this place will return to their proper place in time. John, looking at Rachel, says, you can't leave her here like this, but Morpheus explains that Rachel is already dead. The sand was the only thing keeping her alive, and she will soon die. John still says they can't leave her like this. Morpheus replies, very well. He tells John to wait outside. Morpheus then gives Rachel a peaceful, happy dream of her and John together and in love. Morpheus, he then leaves the room, and Rachel, she dies. She passes away, happy. With their business now done, Morpheus, he's going to leave John. Before he does, though, John asks for a favor. He says that he's been suffering from these nightmares for the last 10 years. He's wondering if Morpheus can, you know, get rid of them. Morpheus says, I understand very well. Morpheus, he then teleports away. John Constantine then hums. The other popular song about the Sandman, the 1954 song, Mr. Sandman by the Cordettes. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. 
make her the cutest girl I've ever seen, etc, etc. Issue 4, A Hope in Hell Morpheus has his pouch of sand. Now he is off to hell to retrieve his helmet. Morpheus, he travels and arrives at the gates of hell, and he is talking to some of the demons guarding the gates, and he demands to speak to Lucifer Morningstar. Eventually, Morpheus is passed along to Etrigan the demon, who will accompany him to Lucifer. Etrigan the demon is a character in the DC universe that was created by Jack Kirby in 1972. He is a demon from hell who, despite his violent tendencies, usually finds himself allied with the forces of good, mainly because of Jason Blood, a human whom Etrigan is bound to. Etrigan is leading Morpheus through hell. They walk through a section where there are all these people in cells. One of the women in the cells is an African woman named Nada. She refers to Dream by the name Kaiko. And she says, crying, I hoped one day you would come to free me. Free me, my love, please. Morpheus, he changes his appearance to look like an African man. This is how he must have looked to her when they met many years ago. He greets her and says, It pains me to see you like this. And she replies, You ordered me confined here. Your forgiveness can free me, I implore you. Don't you love me? Morpheus says, It has been 10,000 years, Nada. Yes, I still love you, but I have not yet forgiven you. Morpheus walks away. This Nada woman and Morpheus' history will be elaborated on in future volumes, but Morpheus, he loves this woman, but he has nonetheless condemned her to be tortured in hell for the past 10,000 years. Morpheus and Etrigan continue walking through hell. And eventually, they reach Lucifer Morningstar, the ruler of Hell. Neil Gaiman apparently wanted Lucifer to look like David Bowie, so now that I mention it, I am sure you can see the resemblance here. Lucifer tells Etrigan to leave them. Morpheus explains to Lucifer that his helmet has been taken from him, and he believes one of Lucifer's demons has it. And Morpheus, he wants it back. Lucifer explains he is no longer the sole ruler of hell. There was a civil war and now he shares his duties with two other rulers and they rule as a coalition now. So there is Lucifer but there is also Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies, who appears to just look like a big fly. And then there is Azizel. Azizel is depicted as a void of changing size and shape populated with multiple sets of fangs and eyes. Morpheus explains to the three of them, again, that his helmet was stolen, and he wants it back. He does not know the name of the demon that stole it, though. So Lucifer decides to summon every demon in hell, and they can figure it out. So Morpheus, Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Azizel sit atop a peak and overlook every demon in hell across this whole hellscape. All the various demons look uniquely different, some scary looking, some stupid looking. Morpheus releases some of his sand, and it creates a path directly to the demon that stole his helmet. The demon that has the helmet is named Kronzon. He is a Duke of Hell, one of Beelzebub's. Kronzon admits he has the helmet, but he claims that he traded a mortal for it, fair and square. He has broke no rules of hell, and he refuses to give it back. He tells Morpheus if he wants it back, he has to fight him for it. Morpheus accepts the challenge. Karanzan challenges Morpheus, but not to a fist fight. He chooses the battlefield of reality instead. So the way that the two of them are going to battle is quite peculiar. They each have to imagine up some sort of creature or thing or concept and outdo each other, outdo their own reality. Karanzan imagines himself as a dire wolf. Morpheus imagines himself as a hunter, horse mounted, that stabs the dire wolf. Karanzan imagines himself as a horsefly, stinging the horse. Morpheus counters as a spider, capturing the horsefly. Karanzan counters as a snake, eating the spider. Morpheus counters as an ox, crushing the snake. 
Carranza encounters as an anthrax virus infecting the ox. Morpheus, he switches his strategy now. Rather than going on the offense, he switches to defense. He says that he is the world, space floating and life nurturing. Carranza encounters and says that he's a nova, exploding, enveloping the earth. Morpheus counters as being a universe, all things encompassing, life embracing. Carranza counters as anti-life, the end of everything, the end of the universe. How do you counter that? Well, Morpheus, he counters and says, I am hope. Carranza thinks. He thinks some more. He is stumped. He says, uh, I don't know. Carranza has lost. Lucifer, he has Carranza taken away. And Morpheus is given his helmet back and he thanks the lords of hell. Morpheus prepares to leave, but Lucifer asks him why they should let him leave hell. A million demons now stand in his way. Lucifer says helmet or not. Morpheus has no powers here. What power have dreams in hell? Morpheus replies, you say dreams have no power here? Ask yourself this, what power would hell have if those imprisoned here were not able to dream of heaven? Morpheus, he leaves and walks right out of hell. All the demons step aside, unable to meet his gaze. Lucifer mumbles to himself, One day, my brothers, I shall destroy him. Epilogue, we jump to Arkham Asylum. John D, aka Dr. Destiny, is told that his mother, Ethel Cripps, has died, and he has given her amulet the same amulet that she received from Karanzan the demon in 1930, the one that helps protect one from spells and curses. Issue 5. Passengers John D, aka Dr. Destiny, with his mother now dead, decides he is going to escape from Arkham Asylum. He kills a guard and takes the guard's gun, and he starts sneaking his way out of the building. Before he leaves, though, he runs into the Batman villain, Dr. Jonathan Crane, also known as the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow is in a straight jacket and appears to be fake hanging himself with the hangman's noose. The two of them talk. John explains how his mother gave him her amulet and it keeps people safe from things. And now he is going to go get out of here and get his Dreamstone Ruby. He is referring to the Sandman's Dreamstone Ruby. John had it in his possession many years ago, and he caused all sorts of havoc with it. Well, now he wants to get it back, and he tells the Scarecrow, I'll drive everybody in the whole wide world mad, and then they'll make me a king. Scarecrow tells John, who sounds scary, have a nice time. Promise when you get back, you'll tell me all about it. John's confused, he tells the Scarecrow. You don't understand. I'm going to rule the world or destroy it. I'm not coming back. Scarecrow replies, we always come back here. John, he climbs out a window and he manages to slip out of Arkham Asylum. He sees a dead body hanging that the Scarecrow left outside. John, at gunpoint, gets into a nearby car, being driven by a woman named Rosemary Kelly, and he gets her to drive him to where this ruby is being held. Over at Justice League headquarters, we see another DC character, Mr. Miracle, also known as Scott Free. Scott Free is the son of New God Highfather, and when he was a little boy, he was traded to Darkseid as part of an exchange of heirs to stop the fighting between their two planets. Scott grew up on Darkseid's home planet of Apocalypse, where he grew up in one of Granny Goodness's terror orphanages. He eventually escaped and came to Earth, but he still to this day has nightmares of his childhood. Mr. Miracle, as an adult now, he awakes from a bad dream of his youth, and Morpheus is there to greet him. Morpheus explains that he is looking for his Dreamstone Ruby, and was told to ask the Justice League of its whereabouts. Mr. Miracle goes to a computer to look up some information on this ruby for Morpheus. Mr. Miracle explains that a psycho calling himself Dr. Destiny was using it to affect people's dreams, making nightmares real, that kind of thing. 
and the Justice League took him down, and they moved the ruby to their trophy room on the satellite. The satellite got destroyed, though, but they might have moved it before it got destroyed, so it could be in the Justice League's Detroit Fortress or their secret sanctuary. He's not sure. But he knows someone on the Justice League who might know. He figures, who's he going to ask? Who might know? Batman? No. He decides to go and ask Martian Manhunter. So the two of them go to see Martian Manhunter. They knock on the door, and Martian Manhunter is in his Justice League robe. Martian Manhunter recognizes Morpheus as a god, a very old god. He knows him by another name. The Martian kneels down before Morpheus, and he says, Lord Zorro, I greet you humbly. May you guard us in the darkness on the pathway between waking hours and protect us in dreams from the flame of your wrath. Morpheus asks a Martian? I thought your kind were aeons gone. Martian Manhunter explains that he is the last of his race. Eventually, they get to talking about the ruby, and Martian Manhunter explains that all the Justice League trophy stuff was moved up to a warehouse in upstate Gotham to a little town called Mayhew, and the ruby will probably be there. Morpheus thanks them both, and he heads off. Martian Manhunter and Mr. Miracle then walk into the Justice League kitchen, where Martian Manhunter promises a secret stash of Oreos for them to eat. Martian Manhunter loves Oreos, in case you didn't know. Morpheus, he moves through the dream world, riding people's dreams, getting closer and closer to this town of Mayhew. And he eventually arrives and pops out of the dream world into the real world, just outside the Mayhew storage facility where his Dreamstone Ruby is being held. Morpheus, he goes into the warehouse, and sure enough, he finds his Ruby in one of the crates there. Morpheus, he grabs the Ruby and says, At last. Only for some reason, the Ruby rejects Morpheus, and Morpheus falls ill and passes out on the floor. The reason why the Ruby rejected Morpheus is that when Dr. Destiny last had the ruby, he manipulated it, forced flaws in it, and even added circuitry to it, and now it was attuned only to him, and no longer to Morpheus, to the point that it would actually reject Morpheus. We jump over to that John D. Dr. Destiny. He has gotten this Rosemary woman at gunpoint to drive him all the way to this Mayhew storage facility where his precious ruby is. When he arrives, he shoots and kills Rosemary, his ride. John, he then heads into the storage facility. Morpheus is passed out on the floor. John finds his ruby on the ground and he begins talking to it. He says, Did a naughty man try to use my baby? He didn't know that you were mine these days. All mine. Every glint and facet. Oh, baby, you even feel more powerful than before. Where did the extra energy come from? Have you been fickle? Have you been with someone else? It doesn't matter, darling. We're together again. That's all that counts. John then leaves and begins to try and fulfill his goal of driving the whole world mad. And to start, he heads to a diner that's open 24 hours a day. Issue 6, 24 Hours John D. is in this diner with the ruby, just hanging back for now. We are introduced to all of these random civilians. There is Bette Monroe, a waitress who writes stories about each of her customers. There is Marsh, a former mailman who was placed in jail for five years for stealing mail after his wife died. Now he's a truck driver. There is Mark a young man popping in for a quick coffee before a job interview with dreams of being a rich businessman. There's Judy, a lesbian wearing a Joy Division jacket in love with a woman named Donna who is elsewhere. There's Kate and Gary Fletcher, a married couple, happy on the surface, but deep down they have issues. This issue takes place over 24 hours in this diner. John, or Dr. Destiny, 
he starts using the ruby to make everyone go mad, slowly at first, but then he ramps it up. Not only are the people in the diner going mad and being tortured for his own personal amusement, but also people all over the world. At first, it's subtle. In hour two, Mark, the guy that has the job interview to get to, he wants to go leave to get to his interview, but then something comes over him. The ruby influences him to stay longer. He decides to sit back down and have some more coffee, even though he can't explain why he feels like doing that. In hour three, on TV, a kid's show featuring a puppet called Dino the Dinosaur, it takes a bad turn when the puppeteer starts instructing the kids how they should slit their wrist and be sure to slice down, not across. In hour five, everyone in the diner is getting a little restless. Hour seven, John starts experiencing their dreams and desires of everyone in the diner. Mark, who wants to be this rich businessman. Gary, who likes beating hookers. Kate, who dreams of killing her husband, Gary. In hour 10 and 11 on the news, there are reports of everyone going crazy in a wave of madness and suicides and bad dreams and people falling asleep all over the world. Dr. Destiny then gets bored and he makes all of the people in the diner celebrate him and carry him on their shoulders and tell him he's beautiful and they write God in blood on his chest. Hour 13, Dr. Destiny makes everyone in the diner have an orgy and he just sits and watches and says, neat. Hour 15, he gives them back their minds just for a little while and everyone in the diner is going crazy and is really scared and is asking him why is he doing this to them? What did they do to him? And Dr. Destiny explains he's doing this because it's fun and he can do it. Hour 17, he makes them start mutilating themselves and hammer nails into their hands. Hour 18 to 23, the patrons of the diner begin fighting and biting each other, but then they dance for a little bit, and then they stab needles in their eyes, and eventually they all die. Hour 24. Dr. Destiny is done now and is prepared to leave. But finally, Morpheus finds Dr. Destiny and enters the diner. Dr. Destiny comments, I'm glad you're here. It was starting to get a bit boring, but you don't look strong enough to make it interesting, do you? Issue 7, Sound and Fury. Around the world, everyone is still going crazy from Dr. Destiny messing with the Dreamstone. Some people are getting violent. Others are praying because they think it's the end of the world. Morpheus confronts Dr. Destiny, or John, and John, he explains he is using the ruby to get into people's deepest dreams, to dredge up the blackness from their souls, and he is hurting them all with it. Morpheus explains that he made the Dreamstone from the fabric of his being long ago. It is powered by his spirit and was made to manipulate the dream world that he rules. It is not made for what John is doing with it. Morpheus tells John that he must stop. He must give him back the ruby and allow him to try and reverse what John has done. John doesn't care though. He is instead says he's going to kill Morpheus, and he wants to battle him. Morpheus is not happy. He accepts this challenge, though. He puts on his dream helmet, and he walks into the world of the dreaming, and he tells John if he would steal a dream lord's power, then he shall do it in the dream lord's realm. Morpheus then disappears into the dreaming. John yells, Coward! He commands the ruby to take him into the dreaming as well. So John has now followed Morpheus into the dream world. John is now in the dream world and he starts floating through and jumping in and out of people's various dreams causing havoc to the dream world. Cain and Abel and their pet gargoyles Goldie and Gregory are hiding in the dream world for cover. Eventually Morpheus reveals himself and confronts John. John, with the ruby, starts using it to shoot at Morpheus with some kind of red energy beam from the ruby. John starts gloating that he is going to take it all, all of Morpheus' life, every bit of it. John, with the ruby, keeps firing at Morpheus, keeps sucking Morpheus' essence. He continues gloating and saying, does that hurt? 
I bet it hurts a lot. What does it feel like to get the life sucked out of you? I want to know. John knows that some of Morpheus's life force is in the ruby itself. He continues, I hold your life in my hands. I can kill you. I can end your life. And I'm crushing it out with my hands. John then destroys the ruby. He destroys it in his hands, crushing it. John, he is now in an all-white void. He believes that by destroying this ruby, he has also destroyed and killed Morpheus. John, he thinks now that he will get to rule the dream world himself. However, John messed up. By destroying the Dreamstone Ruby, he didn't kill Morpheus. Instead, all of the power that Morpheus had placed inside the Ruby now returned to him. So Morpheus, he's all healed up, powerful, and in control of the dream world all on his own again. Morpheus feels good. Morpheus he then grows to be the size of a giant in this dream world and he holds John in the palm of his hand. Morpheus says to John, Thank you, John D. I had forgotten how much of my power I had placed in that jewel. Morpheus feels that John should be punished for what he's done. John, scared, asks if Morpheus is going to kill him. Morpheus says he could, but he is feeling more forgiving instead. He is just going to take John home. Morpheus returns John D to Arkham Asylum. They bump into the Scarecrow on the way, who tells John, I told you you'd come back. We always come back. John complains to Morpheus that he doesn't sleep. Morpheus tells him, well, perhaps you will tonight. Morpheus is going to help John get to sleep tonight. Morpheus, he leaves Arkham Asylum, and the crazy world outside that was going insane has now returned to normal. Morpheus has set everything right, and John D., Dr. Destiny, he manages to fall asleep that night. He doesn't dream, but his sleep is sound and restful. Issue 8, The Sound of Her Wings The final issue in this first volume is a departure and a kind of tonal shift from all the doom and gloom and horror we've had so far. It is a real breakthrough issue that kind of explores the emotional core of the series. The title of the issue, The Sound of Her Wings, is in reference to death and is repeated throughout the issue. The point of no return of a person's death is marked with a flutter of wings, then the person's passing. Morpheus has now gathered all of his tools, his pouch of sand, his helmet, as well as the ruby that has now been reabsorbed inside of him. Morpheus is now wondering, what is he going to do with his life? And he is a little bit depressed. He is hanging out in Washington Square Park in New York City and he is feeding bread to some birds. Morpheus is visited by his sister, Death. Death looks like an attractive goth girl, and she is oddly upbeat. Death is a lot of people's favorite character in Sandman, and arguably one of the most popular. She even has a few spin-off miniseries. Death is talking to her brother, Morpheus, who is feeding pigeons, and she asks him, what are you doing? And Morpheus answers, feeding the pigeons. And Death replies, You do that too much, you know what you get? Fat pigeons! Death laughs. She says, It's a line from Mary Poppins. She talks about Mary Poppins and how much she loves it. Morpheus hasn't seen it. Of course he hasn't seen it. He's been locked away for 72 years. Death talks about the word Super Cajifragilistic Espialidocious, which is featured in Mary Poppins, and how fantabulous the word is. She also uses the phrase peachy keen. Death, she asks Morpheus, what's the matter? He looks down, he's moping. Morpheus doesn't know what's the matter. When he was captured, all he thought about was revenge. But by the time he freed himself, his original captor had died. So he took revenge on his captor's son, and that felt fine, he supposes, but it wasn't as satisfying as he expected. His dream world has fallen apart, so... He first retrieved all of his tools, and it was an ordeal, but now he has them, and he's not sure what he wants to do now. Death tells her brother 
that he should have called her. Morpheus says he didn't want to worry her. But Death, she talks some straight talk to her brother. She essentially tells him to get a life. She says that Morpheus is the most self-centered excuse for an anthropomorphic personification on this or any other plane. He's an infantile, adolescent, pathetic specimen feeling sorry for himself because his little game is over and he hasn't got the balls to go find a new one? Death says that she's got some work to do today, but Morpheus can come with her on her rounds if he wants. Morpheus, he agrees to go with her. Before they go, though, a young boy named Franklin talks with Death. He thinks she's kind of cute looking. He offers to buy her a soda, and he asks if he can see her again sometime. She tells him, sure, Franklin, you'll see me again real soon. Her and Morpheus disappear. Death and Morpheus then transport to various places for Death to assist people who are dying and transition them from life in one plane of existence to life in another. First, they go see a violinist named Harry. Harry dies on his couch and Death talks to him. Harry's spirit is now standing beside his own dead body and he's talking to Death, looking at himself, and he comments, Ugh, oh, I look so empty, so old. He asks Death, so I'm dead, now what happens? And Death tells Harry, Now is when you find that out, Harry. Morpheus and Death then transport to a comedy club where a woman is doing stand-up comedy. She does a whole bit on Batman and what compels someone to quit their job and dress up like a bat and fight crime, and she does an impression of an average Joe who works in an ad agency, quitting his job and trying to explain to his wife how he's going to be Batman now. She's doing pretty well and the crowd is laughing, but then she gets electrocuted by the faulty microphone. The comedian spirit is now standing beside her dead self. She is talking to death and she can't believe that she died this way. She says to death, you know, I just realized this is every comedian's nightmare, dying on stage. Death tells her, hey, I thought you were funny. Death and Morpheus then go see a woman whose baby died in her crib. The mother is devastated. Death is holding the baby's spirit and the baby asks, but is that all there was? Is that all I get? And Death answers, yep, I'm afraid so. This baby did not have that long a life. Death and Morpheus then go visit many other people that died that day. And Death, she did her job. And Morpheus, seeing his sister perform her duties with grace, wit, and compassion, had a real effect on him. Morpheus comments, My sister has a function to perform, even as I do. The Endless have their responsibilities. I have responsibilities. Dream then decides to commit to continuing his work, his job, return to the dreaming and repair his realm. At the end of the day, Death and Morpheus return to Washington Square Park. Morpheus tells his sister, you have taught me something I had forgotten. I thank you, my sister. You have given me much to think about. Morpheus and Death say their goodbyes for now. Death has one more appointment to do that today. That kid, Franklin, the one that she was talking to earlier, well, his soccer ball bounces out into the street and he runs after it and he gets hit by a car and dies. And Death, talking to Franklin's spirit who's standing in the street, who doesn't realize that he is dead right now, Franklin, he's happy to see her. He says, hey, it's you. I was talking to you earlier. When you said you'd see me again, I didn't think you'd mean this soon. Death then takes Franklin for a walk over to see his dead body lying in the street. Morpheus, he walks on and he narrates, There is much to do in my kingdom, much to restore, much to create, but that can wait. I have found the solace I sought, though not in the way I imagined. From dreams I conjure a handful of yellow grain, and I throw the grain into the air and I hear it, the sound of wings. Morpheus then prances along happily with a new lease on life as the Lord of Dreams. All right, that was volume one of Sandman, and I thought it was a pretty good opening volume. Although, I do think that this is maybe not the most new comic reader friendly book, because because it is very high concept, and there is lots of obscure DC characters, 
there's a lot to buy into here. This whole endless, these personifications of all of these various things, and they have these realms, and the whole dream world can be a little bit out there. We have Cain and Abel, and one brother is always killing the other, and they have these pet gargoyles, and there's weird characters like the fashion thing and whatnot, and Dr. Destiny, he's so obscure, and he's kind of weird. So there's a lot to buy into that some people may not be able to get past. But I think if you are able to buy into the series, there is a lot to enjoy here. And you have to give Neil Gaiman credit for his creativity in creating this world and this whole concept. I can never think of something like this, as I'm sure a lot of you couldn't think of something like this. But what he's able to do with it is very interesting. And as the series goes on, how he's able to build off of it and really expand this world and explore all these various themes is really something to see. Now, with regards to the artwork, I do feel it is a little bit dated. This is from the 80s. It's not as polished as some comics I read in 2020, but it is a serviceable job to tell the story. Now, in this first volume, we covered so much ground. Issue one, we had Dream being trapped for 70 years. And then in issue two, we explored the Dream World. Issue three, spent some time with John Constantine. Issue four, we went to hell. Issue five, six, and seven, we spent some time with Dr. Destiny and explored him and that whole ruby. And we spent an entire issue just watching this Dr. Destiny torture people in a diner which was very interesting. I don't think I've ever read a Batman issue where we just spend the entire issue watching the Joker torment people. Usually the good guy gets in there. Well, Dream, he just shows up at the end of that issue. So that was pretty interesting. And then we had the whole battle between the two of them. And the final issue where we meet Death, I thought was uh, a real turning point for the series. A little bit lighter tone. And it was very fun. You know, I really liked death and hanging out with her and seeing her do her job and seeing the effect that had on Morpheus was very cool. So I thought this was a good opening volume. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back in the future with Sandman Volume 2.